Okay, let me begin this session by giving a quote by John Piper. He says, The theology and the church and the mission are marked by overarching male leadership and a culture, he's referring to the church now in the book of Acts, <coughs> a culture of tender-hearted strength, contrite courage, and risk-taking decisiveness, and readiness to sacrifice to protect and provide for the community. That's what marked the church in the book of Acts, the foundational church. John White summarizes the popular attitude of how feminism is taking over the church these days, affecting it so grossly. But he makes this comment, he says, A devastating criticism of Christianity is many men see it as not only irrelevant, but also as effeminate. And this is the effect of unsaved men when they look at the church and they see the church being feminized. He said, words and phrases such as unmanly, this is what the law say about us, unmanly for women and kids, wimps, and they can't make it, so they hide behind God are common. Sad, isn't it? That's what's happening today. And this is why many people cite why so few men are being converted today is because that's the view they have of the church. So, with that in mind, what is Christian masculinity? Gentlemen, I want to speak in the next few moments on uh, whatever happened to Christian masculinity. If you would, take your Bibles and turn to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. All right, if you would, look with me here in Genesis 2. And just for the sake of time, if you would, notice number 15, verse 15. Uh, God puts the man in the garden, and notice that he has a twofold purpose. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, two things, to tend and to keep it, to tend it and to maintain it, to watch over it. The old King James says it like this, that the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of of Eden to dress and to keep it. So what is the twofold purpose that God has given you and I as men, as stewards over our family? To nurture and to protect. To nurture our wife and children and to protect them. And this is what I train my girls to look for in a future husband. And I'm thankful for my two sons-in-law that they are not only very sensitive in nurturing spiritually as well as other areas, my daughters, but also protecting them from anything, any ism that could ultimately hurt them spiritually or hurt them in some way morally. Woodrow Crowell said, many men no longer know what it means to be a man. Now, God gives these two qualities, gentlemen, in the text that convey masculinity and they are the words, nurture and protect. We are to cultivate growth. In other words, we are to be a stimuli to stimulate growth in our wives and daughters. And we are to protect or be shields or guardians of them. We are to cultivate growth in that which is, which we have been given stewardship over and to defend it. In other words, if we could kind of sum it up in these two words, we are to be gardeners and guardians of our home. Uh, gardeners in that what we do is we provide the resources as well as the encouragement and the example to nourish our family spiritually, and then we are to be sentries on the wall to protect against anything that could be damaging to their soul or lead them to apostasy. So what does this mean? Rick Phillips says, a real man is not a self-serving adventurer, but one that makes things flourish in the safety of his care and under the cultivation of his, listen, loving hand. Biblical masculinity, gentlemen, is an embracing of God's design and creation to nurture and to protect. And it encompasses the man's choice to lead, mentor, and provide for his family. Now, what do I mean by these things? Let's just make it very practical here. When I use the word lead there, that suggests vision and consistency. 
Let me ask you, I mean, are you a visionary? Some men are very prone to that. They have a propensity toward being a visionary. But, but all men need to have a blueprint for their family. You know, somebody said years ago that if you shoot at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And, and, and here I am in a teenage boy's room who God has saved and called to be a missionary. And he's got a timeline on the wall where he projects finishing school, finishing his training to be mentored in spiritual things and mission work, and then his launch date to go to the mission field. Now, he, he, he's the type of young man that, that he would just yield to the Lord if God changed any of that. But, but he had a plan. He had a goal. And, and I want to ask you now, what are your objectives for your family? Maybe if you're a single young man, what's your objective as far as marriage is concerned? What are you looking for in a woman? What do you foresee as the future? One of the questions you ought to ask a potential dating partner that will determine whether you ought to proceed to the next level in entering into a courtship with her and ultimately marriage. You see, we desperately need to be men that are visionaries because this is a part of leading. But we also need to be consistent in our homes as men. A consistency. Listen, Hypocrites never won their, their family's hearts to Christ. And I ask you, are you as consistent in the way you live as you are in waxing eloquently when you share your theological perspective on things from the Scripture? This is huge. It's huge. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, he said they say and do not, do not after their works. And hypocrisy, you know, just brings down many a good intention when it comes to rearing our families for Christ. Another thing is being mentors. We mentor by example and we mentor by talking to our family. You know, most of us men, we're not conversationalists when it comes to talking to our wives or our kids. I was just reading some of our heart cry reports. I have about 32 missionaries in Eastern Europe right now in Romania and Moldova and the Ukraine and one of them said the other day, he said, you know, just pray for me because I, I become disattached when my, when my little girls want to talk to me. I'm so preoccupied with ministry and preoccupied with my agenda. And when they want to come and talk to daddy about something, you know, I, I just look at them, but I'm not, I'm not connected. So important today, gentlemen, that we give our children our undivided attention. This, this is part of manhood. This is part of being an example in our home. Let me give you an example here. Uh, I, I, I love old books, and today, man, I tell you, Kevin took me over to the bookstore, and man, I went through that place, and I, I just, on the way over there, I said, man, I got more books, and I, I, I probably got 4,000 books in my library, and I said, I don't need any more books. I mean, I'll never read all those books before Christ comes or God calls me home, but man, I just love that stuff, so I get over there today, and I bring 30 books back, you know, <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to get them home now, but, 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 but I love that stuff, but, uh, you know, just... Just reading those books, looking at those books, and, and, but I've got to tell you a story. I mean, I've, every book seems to have a special story behind it. And years ago, we were up in Maine in Canada, my wife and I, doing conferences. You know, my wife always speaks to just women, and uh, she'll speak at women's teas and things when I go into churches and I speak and do a conference or a meeting in the church. And uh, so we went to a book barn one day. It was our anniversary. And we went to this book barn, and they had probably 6,000 books in there and, and very few religious books. And they didn't have them categorized, so I had to go through them just one by one. I found one book in there that day. And it, it, was, the, it, it was the life, a rich biographical sketch, and the works, the poems and the hymns of William Cooper or Cowper. And, and so I know the English pronounce it Cooper, so I'm, I'm trying to, for the benefit of the doubt, you know, win the day here. Anyway, his name was Cooper. And, and, and the thing that was amazing about the book, I almost did not buy it. They wanted 10 bucks for it. You know, it's very difficult for a Baptist preacher to spend 10 bucks, you know, period. But, but they wanted 10 bucks for this book. And so I went up there and Cindy said, Don, get it. You know, it's our anniversary. And I said, you'll remember our anniversary by And I said, all right. So I just, you know, bit the bullet, gave him the 10 bucks. I'm so glad I did, gentlemen. What the author had done was take all of William Cooper's works, his poems and hymns, and correlated them with the events of his life. Do you know the song, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform? He plants his feet upon the seas and rides upon the storm. Do you know he wrote that on the eve of his first great insanity? 
which back then they call severe melancholy, what we would call severe debilitating depression today, insanity. And they're committing him to an ins- a sane asylum the next day. And he writes those words. You say, man, listen, the guy's got victory. I mean, how could he pen such words and then be committed the next day? But he goes into this asylum. And, and listen, when you read about his life, the events of his life, it's just horrible. It's tragic. Loses his mother when he's six years of age. He's bullied in school. He said, I couldn't look at the boys' faces. All I would do is look at the, the buckles on their shoes and recognize who they were by their voice or by the buckles on their shoes. But here's the thing I want to mention to you. He had a very passive father. His dad did not care for him. On one occasion when he came to be with his dad, his dad left him most of the time, but when he came to be with his dad, young William had such a conviction morally before his con- conversion that he read an article on self-murder, on the benefits of killing yourself. And he thought it was morally wrong. And he gives it to his father, and he says, I want you to read this and tell me what you think. And his dad read it, and then he just passively just looked back at William and never said a thing. And William says, I walked away concluding that my father agreed with this man that he was an advocate of self-murder. That's the kind of life he had. You can't afford to be like that as a husband or as a father. You've got to take an active interest. Answer every question. Shut the TV off if you've got one. And sit there and give your child your undivided attention. And weigh it in the light of Scripture, friend. And do it in love. Do it with great compassion. And then finally provides. He also provides. It means like a focused attention. We really take a, a real serious interest in our kids and we give them praise. We, we praise their character at times. Nothing wrong with that as long as we don't become immoderate in doing that because the only thing that can ultimately change the character of our kids is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we need to be more involved in their lives. <clears throat> Listen to this, gentlemen. Interestingly, every passage in regard to the husband's relationship to his wife or the father's relationship with his children in the Bible is teaching the importance of nurturing and protecting. You ever notice that? Almost without exception, and maybe without exception, these passages are underscoring the importance of nurturing and protecting. For example, let me just read some of these to you. Ephesians 5 and verse 23, husband is the head of the wife, and he is the Savior. Christ is the deliverer or the protector of the body. You see the line there, it is a provocative statement. It is something to engage us that we're to follow Christ's example as being the deliverer of his church. We are to be the protector or the deliverer of our own brides. Ephesians 5 and verse 25, husbands love your wives. What does that denote? Nurture. Nurture. You you know, sometimes my wife don't need my theology. She needs a listening ear. She needs to be nurtured emotionally. Do you really take the time to nurture your wife? Loving your wife denotes nurturing her. And it begins by giving her your undivided attention. I remember years ago, I took my wife to a place in the United States, and the reason we've never gone to places like that is we, we, we just can't afford it, you know, or the schedule's so demanding, I mean, I just, just can't take the time. But for a weekend, I, I, I said, honey, I, I got something planned. She said, what is it? And I said, well, it's just, just for you and I, just an overnight excursion. She said, where are we going, Don? She's like a little schoolgirl. She's real giddy, you know, and, I said, well, just wait and see. It's a surprise. So I said, you packed the bag for overnight. So she did. We got in the car and we drove for about three hours up into the mountains from where we lived at the time, which was north of Atlanta, Georgia. And so <clears throat> she kept asking me, said, where are we going? What are we going to do? And I said, it's a surprise. Just hang on. So we got up there and the weekend we went to this, this place. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. It's called the Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina. It's just a beautiful, you know, kind of a, in the architecture, I mean, Lord Biltmore came from England, you know, built this monstrosity of a palace there outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And, and so we had a package deal, you know. We stayed in a motel nearby and had supper together and went to this place. 
And I tell you, gentlemen, we went through that whole thing. And you say, well, man, wasn't that a little bit costly? Well, I got a great deal on it. And I'm so thankful I spent the money. Because let me tell you something. We had begun to drift emotionally apart. We'd still talk to each other, but everything was kind of business as usual. But we were drifting apart emotionally. The respectability as a result of that, the emotional bond revived. The respectability, the love, the intimacy once again surfaced in our relationship as a result of just that little overnight excursion. We lived off of that for months down the road. And I found out that, listen, nurturing my wife is more than just teaching her theology. Sometimes she needs my time to really just fill up her emotional tank. It's very important. I think this is included. I mean, do you think Christ just dispenses theology to us as his bride? No, friend, listen, he cares for us. He's ministering to every facet of our emotional being or our physical being. Uh, listen to the others. Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse. It speaks there once again of nurture. Ephesians 5.27, that he might present a glorious church that is holy and without blemish. It refers to nurture, helping one to grow spiritually. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, husbands dwell with your wife according to knowledge, giving honor to her. What's that denote? Nurture again. Nurture. I'm nurturing her. Psalm 128, verses 1 and 3. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Notice the outcome of that. The fruit is that his wife is a fruitful vine, and his children are as olive plants around the table. This is the product of nurture again. You see that? So, so understand tonight, if you don't get anything else, remember these two things. I mean, if God's called you to be a husband... Your twofold duty is to nurture and to protect, to be a guardian and a gardener of your home. I want to give you some marks of Christian manhood just in passing, some marks of Christian manhood. And let's just once again list them under those two principles, and that is nurturing and protecting. First of all, we if we intend to nurture our wives, we must learn to be leaders. We must learn to be leaders. Ephesians 5 and verse 23, Husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. This denotes initiative, gentlemen. To take the initiative, to, to seek the mind of God, to search the scriptures, to, to properly relate to our wives that we might lead them by our example. Loving her also is a part of nurture. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. As Christ also loved the church. I mentioned a while ago our problem is not that we don't love our wives. Most of us is that we don't love them as Christ loved the church. And I ask you, here's another aspect of loving the church is, is Christ praises her. I ask you a question, friend. Since you've come into the kingdom and your understanding of truth, do you ever find where once you've been savingly joined to the Lord Jesus Christ that he ever speaks derogatory or negatively of his bride? It's interesting. Let me give you this example. You remember there in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist? And he sends his disciples who question the character of the Lord. Are, are you really he that is to come or should we look for another? You remember as they part company and Christ has just told them who he is and what he's done, that he is truly the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, that as they part his company, he looks at those in his presence and he says, there is none that's been born of women any greater than John the Baptist. What did you go out to see? A bruised reed? A broken reed? No. No. More than a prophet. He commends and praises John. And see, the thing is, I think if there's one thing we men are deficient in, is praising our wives. Praising our wives. I'm not, I'm not saying necessarily praising them in the congregation. Sometimes that's fitting. Sometimes it's fitting to, to, to talk about your wife and just how thankful you are before others. But I know most of us feel like, well, they'll think we're really bragging on us because we've got such a great wife. But listen, here's the point. 
Do you in private say, honey, I want you to know I thank God for you. I'm so thankful. I mean, God gave me exactly what I needed. Can I tell you something, men? God has raised up my wife. My wife is not a prophet, except when she deals with me. And she's a gentle prophet. She comes to me and lovingly appeals to my conscience. And she'll question me about things, or she'll bring things up that I've just totally overseen. And I'm so grateful for that. She's exactly what I needed. There have been times when I've questioned that. If I really needed this kind of woman or not. But I look back, friend, and I'm so grateful for the gracious provision of a good and glorious God. So we've got to take that in consideration. We are to be transparent, to be leaders, to be Christian men. We need to learn to confess our faults one toward another. Can I ask you a question? When's the last time your wife and children saw you get radically transparent and confess where you really were spiritually. Honey, I am so needy. Man, here lately, I'm telling you, I have really battled in my devotional life. Honey, I want you to pray for me. I tell you, I've, I've battled in, in maintaining what I feel like, for conscience sake, is a, is a prayer life that pleases God. It also involves being a learner, gentlemen. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Wives are lovers and leaders, or husbands are lovers and leaders and learners of their wives. But here's a thought that came to me one day. It makes for a poor teacher that does not study his students. The best of teachers, instructors, are those that know that one size doesn't fit all. Some kids need to be talked to on more of a personal level. Some young men or young women, they need to be properly related to. Just standing there with a lecture material in front of you and just dispensing that doesn't win the day and really teaching the things that's going to make a difference in their life. It's the professors that really take the time to learn their students. And it's the same way with us as husbands. Do you take the time to study your wife? Also, we're to provide... 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, If any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We've already talked about vision when it comes to nurturing our wives. It breeds a security and an affirmation in our women. Then we talk about the word keeping or protecting. Let me give you a few things here to consider. This denotes being watchful for our wives. Being watchful. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Are we guarding over the hearts of our wives? Are we taking into consideration what they watch on TV? What their intake is in life when it comes to dialoguing with other sisters? Are we listening to what they say another sister shared with them that perhaps we see potentially as harmful to them? Maybe the sister that shared it with them didn't mean anything by it, but yet when they take that thought and begin to dwell upon it, it could be harmful to our wives. Do we know what it is to be discreet? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, to abstain from the very appearance of evil. And how about the passage there in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, that the wise man or the prudent man, he foresees the danger. He can see it coming down the pike, but he avoids it. And he also encourages family to avoid it. You see, keeping or protecting also involves discernment. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, to try every spirit to see if it be of God, whether it's music, whether it's our methods, whether it's our influences, whether it's our associations, we try every spirit to see if it be of God. We must be decisive, gentlemen. Decisive. We've talked about that. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples here. You remember in Jeremiah, the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 35, there was a man by the name of Jonadab. You remember his descendants? God commended this man and said, listen, 
In the generations that follow, there will not be a man that is not a part of the redeemed race that will not stand before me and bring praise to my name as a result of this man's impact upon his family. When you go back into Jeremiah 35 and you look at it expositionally, guess what he did? The Bible says he commanded his children. He commanded them. And what did he command them to do? He said, first of all, he said, I do not want you to set up residences. I don't want you to establish homes. Because it's almost as if this man had a sense of the future. That if they built houses and they established permanent dwellings, that when the enemy came in, then they would be very reluctant about leaving their territory, their land, and they would be absolutely slaughtered, which, by the way, you find in Jeremiah 35, later as you read the text, that's exactly what happened because Nebuchadnezzar comes in and slaughters everybody. But the descendants of Jonadab move quickly, and they avoid being murdered. Furthermore, you know what he tells his children? I don't want you drinking any wine. There's nothing wrong. Listen, I know that drinking wine, drinking this beverage is not forbidden in the Scripture. But I'm saying in this particular family, this man told his children, do not drink wine. Guess what? Jeremiah calls them to the temple. The Rechabites calls them to the temple and says, I want you to come. And then he pours wine, the best wine of the day before them. And he says, drink wine. And you know what the children said? We will drink no wine because our Father hath commanded us. Guess how that plays out? You read the text and you'll find out. But it's amazing. Isn't it interesting that this thing of being decisive or commanding your family, I'm not talking about being a tyrant or a dictator, friend. I'm talking about in love. But say, honey, we must do this. Children, now listen to Dad. I love you and I know you don't want to do this, but this is what I really feel like God wants us to do. This is the directive I give you. Listen, isn't it interesting But God blessed Abraham because he said, I know that Abraham will command his children after him. A lot of people try to water that word command down and say, well, it really doesn't mean that in the Hebrew. That's exactly what it means in the Hebrew. He told them what he expected of them, and they were obedient. Isn't it interesting that one of the qualifications of being an elder, that he is to rule or command his own house well. Once again, he's not a madman to be a manipulator, a micromanager over his family. No, God forbid, friend. But he leads by example. And when it comes to tough decisions, he said, this is what God is leading us to do. And this is what I want you to do. I love you and I'll be praying for you. Listen, it's got to be a pretty irrational kid not to follow that type of leadership. So be decisive and then be courageous. Be courageous. Colosh, uh, 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 Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and then verse 18, where he says, Do not fear, but exercise courage. Brethren, I was with one of our heart cry missionaries in Beirut, Lebanon. His name was Walid Batar. And I got up real early one morning and I went out to his office and I, I sat there talking to him and he, he told me this story. Some of you are familiar with the, with, I guess they call him the prime minister or at least the president of Jordan, uh, King Hussein, the old king. And he said, Walid said when he was much younger and King Hussein was at the, the helm of the, of the country of Jordan, he said he summoned for all the, the Christian missionaries to come to his palace for a banquet. And it, I mean, it was just a huge elaborate feast. And King Hussein got up and greeted all these, all these men and women who had come. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, the reason I've called you here for this, for this banquet is I have two questions for you. Number one, what do you think of Islam? And secondly, what do you think of Muhammad? He said, I want you each to come up here and privately tell me what you think. So they start getting in line. Some of them go ahead and eat first and others immediately get in line. And by the end of the evening, you know, this line is shortened as as everyone's gone up and and answered the questions for the king. Toward the end of the line, there was a missionary there, deeply devoted to Christ. 
He walked up before the king. He paid him the utmost respect. He said, King, I, I want to thank you for the evening. I want to thank you for the banquet. And, and said, But I must be honest with you. If I tell you what I really believe concerning your questions, you could throw me in prison. I would rot the rest of my life away. And the king said, Well, I want to assure you I'll not do that. I want you to be honest with me. This man looked at the king and says, I believe that Islam is out of the pit of hell and that Muhammad was a false prophet. The king just stopped him. He said, excuse me for a moment, and he addressed the whole group. He said, I want you to know tonight I've asked you people to answer those two questions that I introduced at the beginning of the evening. This is the first man, in my opinion, that has told me the truth. As far as I'm concerned, all of you have done my people no good. And he commends this man in front of these others. Can you believe that? Being bold, but with the right kind of spirit, friend, God can use greatly in the context of biblical manhood. Let me just move real quickly here. We, we could look at two models of Christian manhood. And by the way, this would be a, an excellent study for you. I mean, you'd benefit greatly. I mean, it would, it would make your own walk with God so savory, especially when it comes to this thing of, of biblical manhood. But consider the examples of John the Baptist and John the Beloved. Balanced men when it came to manhood. Listen to this. Let me just highlight a few things for you. John the Baptist, a picture of self-denial. Matthew 3 and verse 4, a raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. He was courageous, emboldened in the work. Matthew 14 and verse 4, Herod had taken Herodias, Philip's wife's brother, and the Bible says, For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Speaking of an epistle of boldness, brethren, in Luke 3 and verse 7, John the Baptist heralded out this message. He said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers. He was a humble man, though. In Mark 1 and verse 7, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He must increase, but I must decrease. He was a holy man, Mark 6 and verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy man. He was zealous. You're talking about impassioned for the glory of God, brethren. John 5 and verse 35, Jesus referring to him said he was a burning and a shining light. He was a witness. John 10 verse 41, all things that John spake of this man were true. And then he says, declared in the presence of the multitude who had gathered to be baptized, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was a man that consistently practiced fasting. In Matthew 9 and verse 14, John and his disciples fasted often. I was so humble one day as I read one of our gypsy missionaries' report, his monthly report. At the beginning of every year, he and his church, they go on a 40-day fast. A 40-day fast fast. Now I asked later if they fasted 24 hours for 40 days. Oh no. But we fast one meal for 40 days at the beginning of the year to seek to obtain the blessing of God. This man was faithful in the death, John. Matthew 14 verse 10 it says, and he sent and beheaded John referring to a Herod. How about John the beloved brethren? You're talking about balance. Think about this. Uh, Mark 3 and verse 17, he was one of the sons of thunder. Mark 9, 38 says, And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed us not. And we forbade him, because he followed not us. He was a lover of Christ. John 13, verse 23, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. He was a lover of people. How about it? The Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. Get a load of this from church history. Eusebius said that by the end of John's life, he had simplified his message to one gentle command. Little children, let us love one another. Little children, let us love one another. He said this everywhere he would go. 
Apparently, whenever he was asked to speak or comment, that was his chosen statement, let us love one another. When asked about it, he responded that everything else necessary would be taken care of if that one command would be faithfully carried out. He was a contender for the faith. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verses 7 and 8, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. But he that committeth sin is of the devil. Bold. But he was devoted. Christ entrusted his mother to him. How about it? John chapter 19 and verse 27. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his home. It's interesting, when you study church history, you find that they estimate that Mary lived in the home of the Apostle John for 15 years after the death of Jesus and cared for her with unwavering devotion. He, too, was faithful to death. John witnessed unspeakable things done to his friends. He was exiled to Patmos. Listen, spared by providence, went on the verge of being boiled in oil and was compelled to drink poison, which God did not permit to harm him. They tried to kill him, and yet God sustained his life. So these are men that I believe really epitomize balanced biblical manhood. You see those aspects of a biblical man in these men's lives. Well, let me just conclude with this tonight. I want to just ask you a question here at the end. We asked the question at the beginning, is there a man in the house? Now I'm going to ask you this question. Are you man enough? Are you man enough? And I want to challenge you with something very practical in the next few moments. In the last session here, I'll ask you this question. For those that want to be better men for the glory of God and the good of their family, I'll close with giving you three thoughts, okay? Very biblical. Number one, I challenge you to become the man that God destined you to be. We're talking about something that is predestined, brethren. He has destined you to be a biblical man as one that is a part of his elect. God has equipped us, gentlemen, with a call and a sense to nurture and protect. We've seen in Genesis 2 and verse 15. A position of headship that we're the head of the wife, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But also get a lot of this, a unique male chemistry. In the average woman compared to the average man, the average man's body mass is 40% muscle. The average woman's is 23%. When the Bible says that the woman is the weaker vessel, it doesn't mean that she is inferior to us mentally, but she is emotionally, and she certainly is physically. We need to become what God has ordained us to be. How tragic, though, that so many men, some masculinity, have been dwarfed either by a dominant mother or wife, a culture that has been feminized, or a church people who have been misled in believing that the church needs more than just a man's touch. The story is told of how there was an eaglet that fell among a group of turkeys. The days that followed were absolutely sheer chaos. He didn't like what they ate. He didn't feel a part of the element. I mean, everything was just totally against his nature. And and one day as he grew older and realized that he was not one of them, he didn't look like them, he didn't act like them, he didn't enjoy the things that they enjoyed doing, that a wise old owl told him that you've been ordained for something far more superior. You're not one of them. You're not one of the turkeys. You're an eagle. And suddenly, instinctively, he recognized what he had been called to be, what he'd been born to be. And as he took his flight upward, he 
spread out those massive wings and he looked to greater things and began to view beyond the peaks of the mountain. And as he cast a look, the story goes just over his shoulder to see what he'd left and then turned to look toward the skies. There was something within him that just rose up to sustain him, to enable him as he began to soar over the mountains. Listen to me. I really, even though that's a very weak illustration, understand this tonight. I believe that there are many men that have been foreordained to be soaring eagles, but that sadly they've become feminized turkeys. And we've settled for something far less than what God intended for our lives. God's given us not only all things that pertain to life and godliness, brethren, but everything we need to be spiritual leaders in our homes to the praise of the glory of His grace. Here's another principle I want to mention. This is so significant. Discipline yourself to be masculine. I want you to take your Bibles and look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16. I said discipline yourself to be masculine. And we believe in the sovereignty of God and we believe because of God's sovereign grace He provides us with everything we need but God is not going to do it by Himself. He's commissioned us to discipline ourselves. And I want you to look at this here in this text in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 13 and 14. With all the problems, it almost takes on the very spirit of of a church being feminized, the church at Corinth, with all the struggles they have, it denotes feminization in almost some sense. And yet Paul concludes his remarks toward here, the first epistle, the end of the first epistle to the Corinthians, when he says in chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14, these words. Watch ye... Stand fast in the faith, which you like men. Be strong, and let all things be done with charity. Now, gentlemen, there are five disciplines there that are worth us emulating. Five disciplines. What do these mean? You'll notice when he says here in the middle of those exhortations, Quit you like men. What does this mean? Now this is what I'm reading. I think this is the King James Version here. The New King James says it like this. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be brave. Then he says, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. What does that phrase there mean in the New King James to be brave, but in the Old King James, quit you like men? It means to show oneself a man. It means to man up, to be bold and brave, not be a coward, not be timid or alarmed at enemies. We have a similar phrase, gentlemen, in common use. What do we say to brethren at times? Be a man. Man up. Don't be cowardly. Don't be a wimp. It's interesting. Very striking stories in 2 Samuel chapter 10. You remember David feels like, I'm going to show how much I appreciate Hunan or Hunan's father, what he did for me and my men when we were under the assault of Saul. And the scripture says that he sends men out just to express on the behalf of David his sympathy over the death of his father. The scripture says that Hunan's father, followers, they said, hey, look, David's not here to really express sympathy. I mean, he's not sincere. He's coming in to spy out the land. Don't you believe for a moment that David has good intention? So the scripture says that they take David's men, they shave off their beards, an act of humiliation, and then they cut off their robes at the bottom of the buttocks. 
which was the ultimate humiliation. And they send them back, but they would only even go back to, to town, back into the city because they're so devastated. They're so humiliated. So David says, you stay until your beards grow out. Just stay away until your beards grow out. But David is infuriated. So what he does is he summons Joab to go out and engage these people in war. Well, the Ammonites, the scripture says, that they hire another country there to come alongside and to fight with them against David and his men. It's interesting. Let me just kind of cut to the chase here. But jo Joab says to Abishai, he said, when we go out to engage the enemy, I'm going to fight with one group and you fight with the other. If the one group is too strong for you, then I'll come to your rescue and vice versa. But then he says this to him, and this is a challenge. 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 12. Joab says to Abishai, his brother, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people. What does that mean? Man up. Do what you were commissioned and destined to do. Brothers, when George Whitfield was being assaulted in the streets by an angry mob, his wife sent word, George, play the man. Play the man. Stand your ground. Be an example of fortitude and fight the cause of righteousness before your God. In this text here, gentlemen, let's just look at these things very quickly. But in this text, Paul uses these five disciplines to motivate men toward masculinity as he's using these things to exhort the Corinthian saints. Each one relates to the design of God to nurture and to protect once again that we've already looked at in Genesis 2 and verse 15. So what are they again? Look at each word, each phrase. First of all, watch. It means to wake up or to be alert against those evils formerly mentioned. What were the evils in the early beginning of this epistle that Paul addressed? Listen to these things. Pride, dissension, false doctrine, heresy, lovelessness. Those are the things he just hammered. And he's telling them now, you watch against those things. You be alert. Furthermore, the second admonition, be steadfast in truth. In other words, hold fast, sound teaching. Listen, the way to combat error, whether it's a cultish teaching or some teaching on moralism, friend, that's not biblical. The best way to combat that is not to take the movement and take it apart and analyze it. The best way is to familiarize yourself with the Word of God. Transfix your mind upon truth. Let it become such a part of you that you can readily detect error. This is the idea here. Thirdly, he says, be courageous. And it means show oneself a man. Be brave. Be manly. Not cowardly. Do you see something in these exhortations? Do you see the beauty of balance? The beauty of balance? He said, be courageous. And he's talking about some things that we must do that have more of a negative outcome or a negative nature. But then he talks about other things like loving which is much more positive and something much more blessed. He says, be strong. The word here in the Greek is in the passive tense, which means that we cannot make ourselves strong, brethren. How do we become strong? It means the Spirit gives us an inner strength of moral character when we walk in the light that He's already given us in His Word. 
As I take the word and I familiarize myself with it and I meditate upon it and I internalize it, guess what happens? God fortifies me. The Spirit of God, He enables me and He makes me a conqueror to stand strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And then He says, be loving. In other words, when He says this, let all your things be done with charity, it means... Let love motivate everything that you do. And I, I, I got to tell you, brothers, I, I, I've, been, I've, been a, I've been a good fundamentalist. Because, man, I tell you, over the years of my ministry, I've shot from the hip and from the lip. I've been harsh and hard and condemning and prophetic. And, and look, I'm all for that as long as it's couched in love and compassion and kindness and gentleness. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show the people their sin. Yes, by all means, yes, a resounding amen. But you make sure that when you preach in the open air or when you engage sinners, that it's done with great love and compassion. And you treat the church of Christ like that according. As one man told a young preacher, he said, Brian, remember, grace people are gracious. They're gracious. And that ought to be the thing that characterizes our life. Did you not read the law of Christ by lighter? That was the whole emphasis, brethren. And man, was it a wake-up call for me. That in Strzok's book that I thought they were just trying to get rid of at the conference and didn't conference. He gives everybody a copy of that. And I said, well, they just had an over-order or it was something nobody wanted, so they're just giving everybody a copy. So I started chunking it in the trash can. I picked that thing up and read it, man. It's impactful. Mm-hmm. Teaching me how to love. And it's made the biggest difference in my life and my ministry in the last year. So, brethren, here's the third and final point. To become a Christian man also, I would encourage you to behold the man, Christ Jesus. Behold the man, Christ Jesus. This is so important. Now listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass. What's the glass? It's the Bible, the Word of God. As we behold, it means to gaze, not glance, not glance upon Christ, not just read casually, but we take the time to meditate upon the Savior as we're reading the Scripture. Guess what happens? We are changed into that same image, that same character, that same person of Jesus Christ, even as by the Spirit, from glory to glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You want to become a biblical man? Look at Christ. Behold Jesus. Contemplate His character, His counsel, the way He dealt with people. It was never one size fits all. It was never the same way with every person. Contemplate this Savior because in so doing, the promise is God says, I'm going to conform you to that same image by my Spirit. Listen to this. In our country in, in, in New Hampshire, there used to be a rock formation called the Old Man. And Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, was inspired to write a story about the old man on the mountain. It revolved around a young boy whose name was Ernest, who was told by his mother that there would come the fulfillment of an age-old prophecy that one day a man would be born that in adulthood he would look like the old man of the mountain. And so they waited and waited, and four men came, and they thought that this was the fulfillment of the prophecy, but they never bore the resemblance in adulthood of the old man. In the meantime, this young boy, Ernest, every day felt unusually drawn to gaze upon the countenance of that rock formation, imagining himself as a special object of its love and affection, When you know it, in adulthood, he not only bore the resemblance of the old man in physical appearance, but also in its disposition, its character, one of resilience and courage and stability. You see, he beheld to become. 
Same way with us, brethren. I'm telling you the best way to become more like Christ is not saying, I got to start doing this. I got to come up with my 10 step formula. I've got to quit doing this over here. I got to associate with this side of here. No, listen, the best way to become like Jesus is to behold him in the scriptures. You fixate your mind upon him daily. Perhaps this is something, a practical implication relating to that verse of scripture when Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body is full of light. If he's the object of our eye, our spiritual eye, this is the greatest thing that we could ever do to see the work of the Spirit in transforming us into that same image. So, with that thought in mind, listen, behold, what does it mean? It means to contemplate Him, to become like Him. It requires, though, gentlemen, the principle of time. You've got to take the time to get into the Word and meditate upon what the Scripture says about this Son of God. Don't imagine what you think or feel about Him but rather dwell upon the biblical revelation of Christ, His character and counsel and His very ways. And then secondly, listen to this, very important. Ponder the manliness of Christ in the Scriptures. Ponder the manliness of Christ in the Scriptures. Listen, J.R. Miller said this. No, no, listen, please listen to this. this is, I, I, I don't like to just read things, brethren, unless it's got some significance and unless it has some cutting edge to it. So listen to this. Man, it spoke deeply to my heart. No doubt, Mr. Miller says, there are in Jesus all the gentler qualities which we think of as belonging to a woman. But are not these very graces adornments also of manly character? Is it a shame for a man to be kindly, tender-hearted, patient, and sympathetic? Yet while these gentler qualities undoubtedly appear in the character of Jesus, no less there are in him the elements of strength, courage, heroism, justice, and unflinching integrity. It takes both to make a complete man. You see the balance. It takes both. And the only one that can help us attain that balance is the Holy Ghost. He's the only one. So, consider with me the stalwart qualities of Christ. Listen to this. His unwavering courage. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Endured the cross, despising the shame. His perseverance in prayer. Matthew 26. He went a little further and prayed. His painstaking endurance in the face of rejection. Matthew 11. Listen, you remember it says at the beginning of the chapter, as I mentioned a moment ago, his character is questioned by John's followers. And then it says that he's accused of being a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a drunk. And then he says that they rejected his entire ministry in another city. All that in the same chapter. But in spite of having his character questioned, being falsely accused, and his ministry rejected, friend, listen, it says that Christ stands before the multitude and says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And right there in the context, he looks toward heaven and he says, Father, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, but you have revealed them unto babes. Friend, when I'm under that kind of pressure, when my character is questioned, do you think that I go straight to the Father and praise Him? Or look at the very ones that are questioning my character and denying my ministry and say, please, let me minister to you? This was a real man. This is the man I want to be. A real man. The God-man. Other things. Listen, he was fearless. John 19, verses 10 and 11. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? And Jesus said to him, right in the face of this man, he said, You have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Humility. I, I, I can't get over this. How many times did Jesus tell the people that witnessed his miracles, they were the recipient of his healing grace, tell no one. Tell no one. 
me to deflecting praise. He was had resilient kindness. Man, this brought tears to my eyes one day. I mean, here he is. He got the disciples around the, the last supper table with him. And the Bible says in John 13, 1, that he looked at these men, 11 who would forsake him, the one that would betray him. But he looked in the faces of those that would forsake him. And it says that he loved his own even unto the end. Unbelievable. Compassion. He looks upon the, the multitude and he has compassion upon them. Why? Because unlike us, friend, he sees them as sheep having no shepherd. He doesn't see their dreadlocks. He doesn't see their tattoos or their purple hair or their mohawks. He doesn't see all those things. He sees them as sheep having no shepherd. And then the forbearance of Peter to forbear with Peter. Obnoxious Peter. Have you ever noticed this? One thing that impresses you most about Christ is the caliber of men that followed him. His disciples, listen, friend, if he was feminine, you think those guys, those rugged fishermen like Peter and his brother Andrew would follow such a man? Listen, his disciples were not sentimental or weak. One was a fierce tax collector. Two were called the sons of thunder, while others were hardworking fishermen. Here's the third thing I want to close with in this, this part. Be balanced, men, in your quest in pursuing Christ. Be balanced. What do I mean? Be balanced in your meditation of Christ. View him both as a loving Savior, but also as a very assertive servant. A very assertive servant. Listen. Think about it. Contrast it. The Christ who wept over the death of Lazarus drove the money changers out of the temple. The Christ who spoke so endearing to the little children called Herod a fox. The Christ who said, I go to prepare a place for you. He said, fear him that is able to cast both soul and body into hell. The very Lord Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says that he did not commit himself unto certain ones that were pursuing him. In John chapter 2, the Christ who said to Peter, I have prayed for you, also said to him on one occasion, Get thee behind me, Satan. The Christ who said, all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out, said to impenitent sinners, depart from me, you curse it into everlasting fire. So, can I give you some homework? This is what you can be doing until next time I come back. It might be a few years, but this is what you can be doing, okay? But listen carefully. Do a biography of Jesus Christ. As a supplement to your devotional life, get you a notebook or a journal. And every day, I just challenge you, begin with 15 minutes. When you come across something in Scripture about the Son of God, pause, write down the Scripture, meditate on it, think it through. Lord, teach me from this. Help me to see you in this. What are you teaching me? Is it something about your character? Is it something about your approach or your perspective of things? Is it something about your worldview? Write that thing down. And then you meditate on it throughout the day. And you watch the Spirit change you. He'll make you a balanced man, a biblical man. He will. Any questions? Let's pray together. Father, I, uh, Lord, I feel like I've just embarked on this very, very uh, challenge, this very discipline, Lord, that I've issued to these men. But Lord, I'm so grateful for what you're doing in me, Lord. Lord, I do want to be more like Jesus. And Lord, I pray for these men that there would be such grace that would explode in their hearts that they would long and be driven to be God-besought men. And even as the theme of the weekend, Lord, which is very appropriate to be gospel-driven men. Lord, is there anything that, that better motivates us than the atonement? 
Lord, I pray that you would, by your Spirit, give us more and more glimpses into the beauties and the glories and the realities of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. As Spurgeon said, may we learn to to, to plumb the depths of Calvary. Lord, please help us. And may, Lord, we, we become so immersed in the person of Jesus, the knowledge of him and what he has done on our behalf, Lord, that we will never find any break in our motivation to serve the God of all wonders. We bless your name, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.